discussed a possible running order, um, and we thought it would be sensible for my appeal to go first, subject, of course, to the Lord's view. That's what we think. Uh, I'm glad that we're all on the same page. And you've agreed a, a split of time, have you? Uh, <coughs> well, we, we haven't. Um, I, I currently think that um, with a fair wind, we may get both appeals done today. Uh, with a what? With, with, we, with a fair wind, we'll get both appeals done today and won't need to go into tomorrow. Marvellous. Um, but that, again, is always dependent upon uh, a fair wind. questioning. And, ah. and, and that very fa same fair wind. Um, <coughs> um, my Lord, um, I understand from the clerks that Lord Justice Nuji and Sir Christopher Floyd are dealing with hard copy bundles, but you may be dealing with electronic bundles. Is that correct? I don't use paper. No, I didn't think so from what I've heard you say before. Um, my learned friend kindly drew my attention to the fact that um, with the electronic, because there was an additional, um, we noted that um, Annex C to the appellant's notice, which is the evidence in support of an application for an interim payment if we get that far, may have thrown the electronic bundles out Thank by God. 39 pages. So if you bear with me, I'll bear that in mind when I'm giving you your references. Okay. Well, um, do your best and we'll... Um, I'm Lord, normally pretty good at catching up. Uh, I'm aware. Um, my Lord, you will be aware that um, my appeal, uh, <coughs> 001496, um, is an appeal against uh, Deputy Judge Caddick Casey's 25th of April order, um, which has been described as the April order. Um, and you'll have seen that the, the grounds of appeal, um, <coughs> which appear in Annex A, um, ground one is the primary ground. Um, grounds two and three are alternate grounds in the event that ground one is is not successful. The and the terms of the new order that we seek appear at um, the annex B to the uh, appellant's uh, notice. So where do we find the appellant's notice? Um, in in core one. bundle for zero zero one four nine six. Yes. Where? Um, the and it's behind tab one, um, hard copy page three. I've got it here. Sorry, it didn't come up for some reason. I um, and as I say, the the grounds of appeal start on uh, page seventeen. Um, I'm hoping that's. I may need to, you may need to add thirty nine <coughs> pages. To well, I don't. It's, it's no, actually, you don't. At that page point. fifteen, actually. Page fifteen of you. Don't worry. Yeah, it's page seventeen. It. Fifteen in mind. Um, uh, anyway, sorry, apologies. That's the. You are right. Fifteen is the grounds of appeal. Seventeen is the terms of the new order. Um, the. <coughs> if I can deal with um, some preliminary observations, um, firstly, before I address you with respect to the grounds of appeal, uh, if I may, um, just to um, highlight some of the relevant background. Uh, matters. Um, firstly, um, if I, I would like just to remind your Lordships as to the way in which the case um, was pleaded when the case came before uh, the, Deputy District, the Deputy Judge. Um, and we need to turn to the um, supplemental bundle for this appeal. <coughs> and um, we start with the, uh, and this was before the judgment, um, the, the, the version of the particulars of claim that was uh, before the judge at the trial, at the liability trial, appears behind tab two. Re-amended. Re-amended, particularly as a claim. And Page five. Uh, I, I want to highlight the following paragraphs. Um, paragraph one and eight of the particulars of claim. So uh, this was, you'll see that, the, of course, there was only one particulars of claim. Um, Superwall Limited um, did not produce a particulars of claim, uh, separate particulars of claim. And it could it do so? Can, co can co claimants produce separate particulars of claim? Well, it, it, it may have wanted to do to plead an alternative case that didn't rely upon a fraud, my lord. I thought it was always the case that claimants have to try and force the court to bring. Well, my lord, I, I believe the court has power to grant permission, um, but. Um, where, where do you get that power from? I, I thought, like my lord, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to help you. 
I mean, this is in which part of the rule? Well, Lord, I, 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 without getting too stuck on this particular point, I believe that it would fall within the court's case manage, general case management powers um, to allow a party, because of one of the points that's been um, raised by my learned friend is that it was always open for Superwall to plead an alternate case as to the proprietorship of the patents. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's even said that that could be done without a, uh, a statement of truth. Uh, and all I, the only point I want to make, um, and I don't make, is that this was a joint pleading on behalf of both Mr. Price yes, yes. and Superwall. Um, and you'll have seen what we say in the skeleton, and I'll flush this out, that um, as a result of the um, knowledge of Messrs. Price and Middleton, we say that Superwall always knew, because they always knew, that the 2011 bridge assignment was a fraudulent fiction. The, um, but going back to the, clay, to the particulars of claim, um, paragraph one squarely pleaded that um, Mr. Price was the proprietor of the intellectual properties relied upon by the claimants plural in this claim. And then paragraph eight, again underscored that by reference specifically to the subject patents. And it's a statement of truth? The statement of truth signed uh, by Mr. Festenstein, their solicitor. Um, and you'll see that that um, appears uh, on page 13. And that was always their case. Now, the defence... Par paragraph 8 says that the first claimant is all material times being the registered proprietor. Um, that was true, wasn't it? The, um, that was true, yes. Um, I'm going to flush it out when we look at the reply, my lord. But the, I'm not sure uh, paragraph 8 adds anything to paragraph 1. one. I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> highlighting what I, I, I say are the, are the relevant parts of this pleading. Um, the defence that was at trial was the re-amended re, re defence. And um, this had been um, amended following the decision of the Court of Appeal, um, which had set aside the summary judgment, and I'll come back to that. Um, but you'll flag that, uh, if I can flag par paragraphs, preliminary paragraphs <coughs> 31 to A3, which made it clear that um, my client's um, change in position had been um, because of the further information that had given rise to the successful appeal, the information that had been provided by Mr. Craig, um, Mr. Price's former trustee in bankruptcy. Um, the pleading as that existed at trial, um, we need to highlight paragraph 10. Uh, it's quite a lengthy paragraph. I won't take you through that, but if you read the, all of that, you'll see the, the, the three cases that were put. The primary case in relation to the trust, um, which was ultimately unsuccessful, and we can see that, for example, at paragraph 10.3.1.1, at page 19. Um, the, al the first alternative case, by reference to what was described as the light peak assignment, at 10.3.1.2, it was um, specifically pleaded at 10.3.2 that there'd been no, the bridge assignment had never been uh, produced, uh, and it had actually been asserted that um, it had been produced due to an alleged fire. The um, go further down, points in relation to the uh, bankruptcy were made um, at 10.34 and 10.35. Um, all taking issue with the veracity of the 2011 bridge assignment. Um, and then we can see at 10.6a, making it clear that the primary case um, was that the light peak assignment hadn't been a valid and effective assignment because of the trust. Um, but the first alternative case is at 10.6b. Uh, if not, if there was no trust, then the light peak assignment had been effective. 
10.6b2, in the further alternative, in the event that the life week assignment was of no effect and the rights in the patent, patents vested in Mr. Craig on him being appointed the first claimant's trustee in bankruptcy and they've not revested in the first claimant. Um, we, and the 10.7 squarely said, in the circumstances it is denied that despite his registration, the first claimant is the owner of the patents or any rights with respect to them as alleged or at all. Now, the, the challenge to the, Mr. Price's alleged proprietorship by reference to the bankruptcy had been on the, in the defence from the outset. Um, if you scroll down or turn to page 24, um, paragraph 17 that was in this statement of case struck out was the original pleading, where it made it clear that um, in any event, um, the patents had vested in the trustee um, and the rights remained vested in him. So the point in relation to the ownership by the trustee had always been taken uh, by my clients, albeit the way in which it was put ultimately following the successful appeal um, is as we can see in paragraph 10. The reply... So it was always, always your case that the patent was owned by the trustee and bankers? It was always a part, part, part of our case, always. Um, and I'm going to remind you um, of what you said, my lord, in the Court of Appeal in your judgment um, when we dealt with the overturning the summary judgment, because you recognised that there was a, a clear issue about that. Um, but if I may just finish with this pleading, the pleadings, the reply. Yeah. Um, at, and we, we got to the re re amended reply. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's at, um, it's behind tab four, starts at page, um, well, hard copy page 39. Um, the, and you need to look at, when you consider it, how, it, how their case was put at paragraphs 7a through to 7d. And um, they squarely stood back. They squarely stood uh, by their case that Mr. Price was the proprietor and that the bridge assignment had um, been effective. And we can see that at paragraph seven B on page forty-six. Also highlight just going back to what was specifically said um, in response to our pleading that they'd never produced it. Um, and there, if you go to page 45 and look at Roman numeral 4, this is um, paragraph um, 7a, Roman numeral 4. And um, you'll see there that it was specifically alleged that when the first claimant and Mr. Middleton were forced from their premises, only the first claimant took papers and Mr. Middleton's papers, which included the 2011 bridge assignment, and that were never seen by the first claimant or Mr. Middleton again. Um, at that time, relations between, and then you can see what it said. So uh, they were squarely saying that this was a, uh, this had been a genuine transaction. Um, now, as far as th those were the state of the pleadings before the subject amendment uh, that was allowed by the judge after he gave his liability judgment on the 20th of December. Now, the... Um, was there any evidence about whether Section 67 uh, was in the mind of the assignor or the assignee at the time, um, or at the time that this case was put forward? The, um, there wasn't, my lord. Um, it's fair to say that the, the section 67.3 point um, was first considered <coughs> by everyone um, when the the judge obviously when he was producing his judgment and then subsequently when he gave everybody the further opportunity to put further submissions in, 6 and 67, 3 point. Um, 
but it wasn't at any stage until then pleaded or mentioned or the section 67 or section 67 3 wasn't no but the the it was you have seen that we clearly denied from the outset that mr price was the proprietor um, that was always our case um, and we are, our alternative was that it was the trustee in bankruptcy um, the now did you say why they were claiming there was an assignment when there wasn't pardon did you did you make a claim as to why what was the motive yes claiming an assignment when there wasn't yeah uh, that no and we argued that this was to defeat the um, and the judge found in his judgment that it was to um, defeat the claims of the trustee <coughs> um, the you can see if you to hide assets yes um, you'll have seen that one of the points that we specifically took um, was the fact that, and, and I think we actually plead at this point um, in the re-amended defence, just let me go to that. Yes, if you go to um, paragraph page 20 of the bundle, supplemental bundle, um, as part of the pleading where we were challenging this allegation, um, we, if you look at 10.3.4 um, and 10.3.5, we were saying that um, when the relevant forms had been submitted to the IPO, um, Mr. Price, um, the relevant forms are the forms that registered the alleged assignment. Mr. Price was a bankrupt and Mr. Craig had been appointed. And we made the point no good reason had been proffered to explain why such forms were submitted. 10.3.5.1 uh, that we also from Mr. Craig presumably to avoid his credit uh, yes Mr. Craig Mr. Craig had told us that he had been um, that Mr. Price had not notified the official receiver or Mr. Craig that there had been an assignment and then if you look at 10.3.5.2 when inquiries were made by Mr. Craig in February 13 Mr. Bridge uh, the alleged uh, assignee, assignee had suggested that the assignment had been entered into to avoid his creditors. Um, and the judge so found? He did. Well, hang on. The judge didn't find the bridge assignment was entered into to avoid creditors. He found the bridge assignment wasn't entered into. Um, uh, no, sorry, my lord. He, he found that the bridge assignment was never entered into. He found that the registration of the fictitious yes. assignment and you'll have picked up that the person who filed the IPO forms was Mr. Middleton, um, that um, that was, um, they put they registered it on the IPO to defeat the interests of the creditors. Could you just give me the paragraph oh. in the judgment? In the judgment, yes, my lord. The, um, the liability judgment starts um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, behind tab uh, tab two. Um, we, don't, we don't have the luxury of tabs, Mr. Oh, sorry, my lord. Um, so hard, copy, hard copy page twenty one. You. Uh, you may be on the electronic. We may have to add thirty nine to that, uh, my lord. Um, Which paragraph in the judgment? And the. <coughs> Now, um, that's a useful segue to go into the judgment. Um, and if I can highlight these relevant paragraphs. Um, so, paragraph um, 16. You'll see what was said there about Superwall um, being a company which Mr. Price and Ms. Mr. Middleton were directed, which was substantially owned by Mr. Price. Um, and then you can see the, the footnote at footnote two that um, he was the majority shareholder. Um, the, I've given you in footnote four of our skeleton um, the further details that was, was before the court. Um, in, at the trial. He was a former director and majority of shareholder, shareholder of Superwall. He resigned as director on the 23rd of August 2011. Uh, which paragraph are you reading from? Um, the, my skeleton. 
Oh, from your scale. Yeah. Well, so the, the, the paragraph in the judgment, Lord, is paragraph 16, yeah. where mm. there are findings there as to the company being substantially owned by Mr. Price. Yeah. And you'll see there, there is some further details given in footnote 2 to that paragraph. And then in our appeal skeleton, at footnote 4, which you'll find at page 198 of the core bundle in this appeal, yeah. um, I provided you the details that, was bef that were um, accepted at the trial. Um, he was a 97% shareholder. He resigned as a director on the 23rd of August 2011. That was a, roughly a month or so after he'd been made bankrupt. Wait, which paragraph in your skeleton? Um, it's um, it's a reference. Footnote four is paragraph five. So he resigned. He resigned just after his bankruptcy. Um, Mr. Price's partner, Mr. Middleton, had replaced him as a majority shareholder as per the annual return to 9th of June 2013, and he'd been the registered director, sole registered director of Superwall, since uh, November 12. Um, as for the, um, and you don't need to worry about this, the third claimant, and it was Middle, Mr. Middleton, and he confirmed this in evidence, he um, gave instructions to Mr. Festenstein to sign off on the statement of truth in the pleading on behalf of, uh, of Superwall. So that's paragraph 16. Um, the, when you're considering your judgments, um, I'd, all, I'd like you to read carefully as well um, the paragraphs um, 17 um, through to um, <coughs> excuse me um, 57 um, 17 through to 44 um, deals with the, um, the the dealings with respect to light peak um, the um, it's worthwhile though noting at this stage paragraph 46 um, that um, the chronology with respect to light peak, and this is underscored by a comment in the cost judgment, um, that paragraph 46 on page 33, um, that um, Mr. Price's case was that he entered into this deal with Mr. Bridge, that's the assignment amongst other things. On sorry, the no, I'm sorry, you are slightly confusing me. Are we looking at the skeleton or the judgment? I'm sorry, Lord, I'm go I've gone back to the judgment. I do apologise. Thank you. So, back into the judgment. And... Um, if you read the, I say, in, when considering your judgments, the detailed chronology and factual findings at 17 through to 57, but um, highlighting the <coughs> details with respect to light peak um, are paragraphs 17 to 44. Um, but they assisted um, the judge in making his findings as to the veracity or lack thereof of the 2011 bridge assignment. And that's underscored by what he said uh, par says at paragraph 46 um, the the light peak chronology um, the findings that he made in relation to that um, demonstrated that what Mr. Price and what the claimants were saying about the bridge assignment was false um, paragraphs 45 onwards of the dealings with Mr. Bridge um, and we see the, cons the conclusion that was reached ultimately at paragraph um, 57 um, as to the, the um, and we've already seen that the assignment um, not being uh, a true transaction <coughs> I'd like to, you to note paragraphs 58 to 62 because it's there those paragraphs confirm that the judge found that the transactions which my clients <coughs> entered into and which they relied upon as giving them the title to the IPR, he found that they were genuine transactions, that they had taken place, and had the IPR remained vested, uh, sorry, had the IPR been subject to the trust as claimed, it, they would have passed the title to, ultimately, uh, Flitcraft Limited. Of course, the, the fundamental basis of that was the trust, and, and that failed. But... The reason why I highlight this is this is a case where, and you'll see from the judgment, in contrast to the findings that were made vis-a-vis -vis Messrs. Price and Middleton, my clients' witnesses were all found to be honest. 
and that they had come to this having believed they'd acquired this IPR and they were having to defend this claim by reference to information that had been provided by others, initially by Mr. Bridge, um, hence why they, how they put their case, and then subsequently by reference to the fresh evidence that Mr. Craig had provided, which ultimately was a, allowed uh, when the Court of Appeal considered their appeal um, in 2022. Um, now, as far as the, the veracity of the witnesses are concerned, and you'll have that at 65 um, onwards. So you say the veracity of the witnesses is relevant to what in the Section 67 appeal? <clears throat> well, the Lord, the, uh, this, isn't a, this isn't just a case where Mr. Price knew that this was a fiction. Mr. Middleton knew that this was a fiction. Um, and I highlight, you'll see, Mr. Price deals with it, he's dealt with it 66 and 67. Um, 68 and 69 is what is said about Mr. Middleton. And you'll see at 68, um, Mr. Middleton was an active party in making the appli an application to the I UK IPO based on a claim that had been an assignment to Mr. Bridge on the 28th of March 2011. The evidence before the trial judge was that he was the one that had submitted the forms to the IPO. And of course, his evidence sought to stand by this document. So, and you'll have seen how I've put it. I say that given the control and ownership of Superwall by Price and Middleton, um, their knowledge is to be attributed to the company. So this is a case where from the outset, Superwall brought this case knowing that notwithstanding what it had pleaded, Mr. Price was not the proprietor. And in fact, the 2011 was a fraud and it was a, it'd been um, fraudulently registered at the IPO. And of course, we say, and it's an, an overarching comment, particularly when one considers abuse. Um, which is obviously a, an element of our appeal, that they'd not only given instructions... So what did the judge say about your submission, that this was all a fraud, um, and that therefore they should not have any indulgence under Section 67? Well, um, that's, he deals with that in his Section 67 judgment. Yeah, where, where do we see that? Um, and what, and what I'm trying to work out is you say, as I understand it, this was all a fraud, it was a deception of the court. Amongst them. The, 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 the court, therefore, should look with the most grave opprobrium, if I can use that yes, complicated Lord. word, at what they did, and should not grant Section 67 relief to rectify um, what was an action based on fraud. Now, I want to know what the judge said about that, but <coughs> the other side of that story is, well... They can be punished in costs, um, which is what vaguely has <coughs> happened. Question whether that's a sufficient punishment. And the action based on the exclusive license succeeded and was a was a good claim. And so why should they not be allowed to get over a technicality if they pay all the costs? Well, um, my lord, the submission that I made were twofold in the same way that I'm making them here. The primary submission was um, as a result of the um, fraudulent claim which they had brought. And I do say, and I'll develop this, that it is a substantive issue because although it is procedural in nature, Section 67.3 is substantive in effect because it goes to standing. <coughs> um, and my primary submission, and this is the primary submission, this is the primary, this is ground one, is that such was uh, the abuse in this case. Um, remember, they'd got summary judgment on the back of this. I'd had to appeal to this court to set that aside. They had given false evidence in this court. They had got a, commit, com a committal order against my client, Mr. Thomas Flitcroft, on the back of uh, their false case. And then I'd had to, and my clients had had to spend huge sums of money exposing this fraud. And it's only when we get to the judgment that they reveal that they're forced to then say, yes, well, we're not standing by the truth of what we said before, and we amend. Uh, and so my primary submission was, in these circumstances, 
for the reasons I say out, I set out in the skeleton, which it, before you, my lords, which mirrors largely the submissions I made before Deputy Caddick. It was so serious um, that they should be stopped um, from pursuing um, what was left of their claim. And, and re can I just remind you, my lords? I mean, that that's not. I mean, that, that's. I mean, I get all that. That's not a question of law. That's a question of fact. Well, my lord, you'll see that the appeal the appeal is based on <coughs> alleged errors of law, uh, alleged errors of fact, and also failure to exercise the discretion correctly. I mean, what's the area of law? Well, my lord, the area of law is the, and we say that the judge found that this was, um, and I deal with this. I deal with this. Um, well, just in two words, what is it? The the judge found that this was section 67.3 was procedural, not substantive. Um, and we say he fell into error there because although, and I put it in these terms, although section 67.3 is procedural in nature, in requiring the proprietor to be joined, it is a mandatory requirement that goes to standing. I get all that, but what I don't understand is what difference it makes to use those tags. You see, well, Procedural and substantive is what lawyers love to talk about. It's a statutory requirement. The action can't succeed without the statutory requirement being fulfilled, and the court has a discretion to allow people to amend to comply with it. It does. Do you agree with all that? I do, my lord. Right. So how does it help you to say it's substantive uh, because it goes to standing? Of course it goes <coughs> to standing, and in that sense, maybe it is substantive. But how does that help? Well, the appeal. Your you your point is it was so serious. They're such bad people, if I can put it in the vernacular, uh, that they shouldn't have been given any indulgence by the court as a matter of discretion. Right. That is a point that I do raise. Yes. But that is the point, isn't it? Um, that 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 goes to obviously we say there are errors of fact that feed it, feed into that error of discretion. But I am also saying that the judge just considered this as a procedural issue. He didn't approve. He didn't approach this. That this went to standing. But did he de he appreciated there'd been a terrible fraud perpetrated on him. Um, he, he he did. But when he describes, for example, um, and you'll see this in the uh, cost judgment, when I put the submission to him, for example, when we look at the Bioko point about costs, I said the amendment was a wholesale change in their case, and he said no, it's not a wholesale change in their case. And that's where the standing issue comes in because, and it's a point I take issue with with my, my learned friends in their skeleton, their case was that Mr. Price was the proprietor. So their standing is based on a fraud. When they amend to change it post-judgment to join the OR, they're now saying they're jettisoning their fraudulent standing case. So I do say that the judge, in categorising it as merely procedural, fell into an error of law because he didn't appreciate or didn't take into account the substantive nature of the subsection. Um, and it was a, subs a wholesale change in their case because they brought this case all along on the basis of a fraudulent um, allegation which gives them standing, they say, to, re to recover their relief. Um, you asked me, my lord, where the judgment... Can just slightly unpick that, because the patentee and the exclusive licensee are in a different position. The exclusive yeah. licensee, if you want to discuss it in terms of standing, the, the exclusive licensee acquires the standing by uh, showing that he is an exclusive licensee under the patent. Not under a particular person's patent, but under the patent. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why you say the exclusive licensees, as opposed to the patentees, standing depends on it has anything to do with the fraud. My Lord, it's the standing to recover the relief. They can't recover the relief that they seek under the uh, under the statute, unless the proprietor is joined, I accept, and and obviously I, I've got to, and I do accept what Lord <coughs> Justice Arnold said in the Nuremberg case that we that we both cite paragraph twenty one. What the purpose of section sixty seven is, 
is is there for um, the um, the it, it's to ensure that the um, the exclusive licensee um, can seek to um, recover uh, in particular damages but it could be an account of profits in relation to where there's been an infringement of its rights which may give rise to relief that's separate and even greater than the the patentee um, but the point is is that the mandatory requirements of section 67 to have standing to recover those damages or other relief the proprietor has to be joined we're not in. We, we've, I've given you the relevant references, w which contrast other provisions of intellectual property statutes, where there's the or there's the diff the uh, escape route with the leave of the court. There isn't here in, in section 67. The, the patentee. So when I say standing, it is the standing. They cannot get the relief until unless the patentee is joined. So you'd accept that standing doesn't depend on the identity of the proprietor. Um. Well, the proprietor has to be joined, so um, they can't, and this is why they had to amend, mm. um, they couldn't get the relief that they were seeking unless the official receiver was joined. Um, I mean, there's a lot of authority about this situation in the law of assignment of shares in action. There are no law. Back in the 19th century, when an equitable assignment could only... The, the equitable assignee could only succeed if he joined the equitable assignor. And I can't remember what all those cases say, but I, I'd be surprised if they didn't say, <coughs> so long as you joined the equitable assignor before you got your judgment, you were okay. Uh, Lord, and, and that, that's my understanding. And, and I think my little friend's side, William Brandt, which is a case dealing with equitable assignment. But here, of course, we're dealing William with... William Brandt. William Brown. And yes, so I, I remember that name. Um, yes. But of course, my lord, here we're dealing with a specifically a specific statutory provision, which requires the. Uh, Why should it be different under the specific? I mean, my we're lord, trying to do justice. We're not trying to put obstacles in. The no, way. Uh, my lord, and I and I accept that, and I accepted before the deputy judge, and I accept it for you. The failure to join the proprietor doesn't render the proceedings um, a nullity. I also accept that the judge um, had the power post-judgment to allow an amendment um, to join the true proprietor. Um, what I am saying is, is that in acceding to their application, he made various errors, one of which was his consideration that Section 67.3 was just procedural in nature. And I'm saying in doing so, he failed to take into account the what I say is the substantive effect, which well, we've is... Got, we've got that substantive effect. I mean, we understand that. I mean, the, the, uh, for my part, I mean, I put it to you once and I'll put it to you again and then I'll shut up. It seems to me that um, what you're saying is this is such an egregious fraud. The whole proceeding was a fraud. It was brought on the basis of deceiving the court. And that is so serious that when you come to exercise your discretion under the... CPR as to whether to allow amendment, it is um, inappropriate to do so. And, and I, that seems to me to be cut through the substantive procedural debate, which doesn't, to me, much help. Well, my lord, the, for the reasons I set out in the skeleton, and uh, in my skeleton, yes, and the um, ground one is dealt with at paragraphs um, 27. Um, through to yeah. um, 47. Mm -hmm. the, the section 67 is only one of the, the limbs of attack I make to the um, to the decision to allow the amendment. Sure. Um, the, um, Lord, you asked me um, as to what the judge, uh, how I put the case. I mean, I, I say I put the case as I'm putting it to you um, now. Yes. Um, the, uh, but if you want the relevant extract from the judgment, this is the cost judgment um, it starts uh, at hard copy page 78. You, my lord, may find it at 117 if we have to add 39 pages, but it's paragraph 14. Of which, the, which bundle is it in? Not the cost of the section 67. It's the core bundle of the main appeal. Of the main appeal. Mm -hmm. And it starts, uh, it's the, it was handed down, it was an oral judgment given at the hearing on the 16th of March that was then handed down in writing 
on the 26th of May. Um, and the, if you look at paragraph 14, paragraph 14 summarises the submission that I made before Judge Carrick. I'm sorry, just give me the page. At 81 of the hard copy, you may need, it's paginated page 81. Okay. Paragraph 14. You want to add? Yeah, you have to add 39 pages to it. Yeah. Paragraph 120. Yeah. Page 120. Okay, thank you. 14. Um, so, my lord, the... <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, I was just picking up points I wanted to just cover, make sure that you've got from the judgment. Um, and I, I identified, this is the liability judgment now. So um, we were, I just highlighted to you what was said about Mr. Middleton, a paragraph. Um, Where does the judge deal with, he sets out the point you've made in 14. Where does he deal with it? I've got 22, is it? 22. With it, um, he deals with my position. Um, it, well, section 67, it's really the, the whole of the conclusion section, it's at 16 onwards. Um, so he separates um, Mr. Price and Superwall, and you say he shouldn't have done that. Uh, I mean, this was Superwall's amendment, and no, he shouldn't. Superwall stood by this. Um, and they Price was there as the, and they knew that we were challenging it. They didn't seek to amend. Of course, my learned, my learned friend in their skeleton says, well, you know, they could have amended. But in my submission, in the real world, that just would never have happened. They would have had to expose their own fraud. I mean, you go as far as saying that this was, uh, he, he failed to accord in the sort of language of appeals from discretionary decisions. You say he failed to accord sufficient weight to the fraud in which the claimants conspired together in allowing permission to amend when the action had been brought deliberately to, mis mis to just mislead the court. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't see the case goes any further than that. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it's a good or bad point, uh, Mr. Maynard Connor, but it, it's a clear point. Which, which, for my part, I completely understand. And you say he just didn't give it sufficient weight so you can, you, the Court of Appeal, can get your screwdriver into his judgment and overturn it. You shouldn't have allowed the action to proceed. Um, I do say that. Um, I don't want to um, jettison all the points I've set out in my skeleton that you've read, which I rely upon, yeah, that underscore that. Of course, and coming back to a point I think you made a little while ago, um, and this was a point I made to the judge um, that if he was ro if he was against me on that, and if you're against me on ground one, mm. then what absolutely he should have done was say that you're paying all the costs up until the date of the amendment. Um, and that's your Summers and Fairclough point. That that Summers and Fair and Bioko, and um, and and I do say and so on you that shows this, please, Lord. Yes, um, the. Just for your note, on this, um, this is this is ground three um, of the of, of the appeal, mm. um, and I deal with that um, at paragraph um, fifty one onwards of my skeleton. Uh, Bioko, you'll find in the authorities bundle, my lord. Uh, Can you uh, give us an idea of what all the costs would have been? How much? Um, the costs were quite heavy. Um, it was sort of two or three hundred thousand. More than that, because there was a payment on account that was ordered. Okay, so it's, it's more than that, half a million. Uh, um, Can you also give us an idea of what they're claiming by way of um, an account of profit? Uh, well, we don't have we don't have those figures. Um, of course, the, the 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 claim is only in relation to the old injectable product. No, I know that. Um, there was total cost stated by the 
judge in the cost judgment of paragraph 37, your total cost was 634,000. Yeah. Okay. So 634,000 is what you're asking that they say the judge should have ordered them to pay as the price of going forward if they're against you on ground one. Yeah. And that's the whole action. Yeah, no, um, the, um, And we, we don't know how much is in this case. No, there'd been a, there'd been a suggest. I mean, it was very loose, you know, we, because we... <coughs> is, it, is it a million pounds, a hundred million pounds? I, on, I honestly don't know. My learned friend can com confirm what his, his well, instructions it's your, are. It's your product. You must know how much you've sold. Well, we are, well, we said that it was a, because it was the old product, and it, there's an issue as to when it ceased. Yes. Um, I mean, the other side, I think they've suggested it could be over a million. Um, we, I think my instructions are, we believe it's a lot less than that, but it's... it's Tur turnover. I think that's right, turnover, yeah. Um, but of course, we are, we've, we've not focused that yet, because... No, again, I don't want to divert down right. rabbit holes, I just wanted to have some idea of what the financial repercussions of our decision is going to be. Yes. Um, the... Lord, the you asked me about the OCO. Um, the you'll find that in the authorities bundle. Um, now, um, if you don't have tabs, um, well, that's occasion I have it's at page forty-eight. It's a, you do have it at seven. Yes, um, the it starts at page forty-eight, um, <coughs> and as I've cited, it's the general rule that you, my lords will be familiar with. Um, and Lord Justice Stuart Smith um, recited that at paragraphs 154 um, A to B. <coughs> one five no, that, that, that's page 154 of the of the of the report. So you'll find that on page, page 65. It's been highlighted for you in the usual way. And you'll see, and it's the, it's the point there, the general, where a plaintiff makes a late amendment is here, which substantially alters the case the defendant has to meet, and without which the action will fail, the defendant is entitled to the cost of action down to the date of this amendment. Um, now, the, he did note there's an exception, um, that where the judge was satisfied that even if the amendment had been made earlier, the action would have been vigorously resisted. Um, and this is a point that's said to me, sent across the other side. Um, I mean, I, we simply don't know. We're speculating as to the, the hypothetical scenario of what would have happened if they had told the truth. Um, we wouldn't have had to go through the factual inquiry that we did do. Well, that, that goes to costs. That, that does go to costs. I mean, this is the cost point, though, mm. on the Yoko board. Right. But presumably, the Yoko, we haven't looked at the facts, is a case where, on the originally pleaded case, the claim would fail. And in order to succeed, the, the, the claimant had to plaintiff had, had to add a new allegation, um, which the defendant then has to join a suit with. But in our case, Superwood's claim was you had infringed the patents which they were exclusive licensees. There wasn't really much dispute about it. You, I mean, you had various arguments as to whether they were or were not entitled to claim exclusive licensees. But as my Lord said earlier, the title of the actual proprietor not part of their cause of action. It was a procedural necessity that the proprietor needed to be bound by the judgment by section 73. But it didn't change the nature of the case that Superwar was bringing against you, which is we're exclusive licensee of this patent, you've infringed. And, and by adding in the section 673 pleading, adding in the OR as defendant, <coughs> they're not changing the nature of the case you have to as against Super War. They're well, changing the identity of the proprietor who has to be joined to the action. Now, you may be right that that's a, a significant change that should have been taken account of by the judge. That's a different question. But I, I'm just querying whether it, it comes within Lord Justice Stuart Smith's formulation. Well, the, Lord, the, facts, the facts in the two cases are different. I accept that. Um, the, the, the case here was that it was accepted that if Superwall had title, so in other words, that um, the license agreement hadn't been terminated, which was the 
primary defense against the Super Bowl, then the old injectable product had infringed the patent. Mm. My client's case was we thought we owned it. If it turns out we didn't, and uh, you have got a license, then the old injectable. And on that, you failed. Uh, well, it was it, it was conceded. The, the, the point in relate in relation to the infringement of the old injectable. Yes, product. but but on on the, the what you said was your primary defense to the Super Bowl claim. The termination is failed. whether the license had been terminated by virtue of the dealings with other people. You failed them. We didn't, Lord. Yes. Um, and so I do accept. I do accept that factually is a difference. However, I in my submission, and I implore this court to recognise that um, this was the, the principle that Symbioco should be extended to this case because Superwall could not succeed against my client on the case that it had pursued for years. Well, I, I mean, and it goes back to a pretty point. simple submission, if I may say so. It is good, but you know, I completely get it. I I find cases on costs particularly when judges say, this is the principle, but the principle has exceptions I'm not going to tell you about, um, pretty unhelpful. Of course, you might be right um, that the justice of this case is, even if you're wrong on point one, that on point two, they should pay all the costs up to the, to the point where they amend. But it's all part of the, you know, we have to say the judge exercised his discretion wrongly because this is such a serious situation that he failed to accord it sufficient weight. Um, yes, same point. It, it, it goes back to that crucial point. I accept that. Really, any uh, I mean, there are case. facets. There are facets to it. So, for example, on Summers, which of course was a, a strikeout. But then let's look at it. If we're going to look at it, because I'm keen to see Summers. My lord, yes. Um, so you, you'll find Summers behind tab eighteen. Just, just on um, substantially altering the case you had to meet. And the slight oddity of this particular case is that the alteration to the case uh, was to align the claimant's case with your case. Because it had been, as I think I asked you quite early on, it had been throughout the case, your client's position, <coughs> that the patent had been owned by the trustee in bankruptcy. So it really is quite a quite a exceptional case from that point of view, isn't it? Well, my lord, it, 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 it's definitely a, it, 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 a very different case, in fact, actually, to Bioko, I'd yeah. accept that. Um, but we can't change the fact that I'd had to fight this case um, to expose this fraud. And then, you know... Well, can I just pause you there? You had to do that to defeat Mr Price's claim. Yeah. Which you successfully did. But it didn't make any difference to Superwall's claim whether the true proprietor was Mr. Price or the OR, as long as it wasn't your case, which was that it was held on trust for empty yet, and so the true proprietor was, was you, Pitcroft. And you failed on that. But once you'd failed on that, and you'd failed on your argument that the, the license had been terminated, it did not actually make a difference to your defence. Superwall's claim, who the proprietor was. My Lord, respectfully, I've got to disagree with that because why? Why, because why unless until they join the no, OR, no, that's the joinder point. Well, but, but absent, in, absent in, that, then in I terms of the cause of action, it didn't make a difference to whether Superwall's claim was a good one or not. Who the proprietor was, as long as it wasn't who you said it was, which was you. Once that claim fails and the, and the, and the license defence fails, it doesn't make a difference to the substance of the claim. What it makes a difference to is whether they've joined the right party. Well, I, my Lord points out, what they've done is they've put forward a case where the right party is Mr. Price. The judge says, no, it isn't. And they said, well, OK, on that <coughs> basis, we haven't joined the right party. Now can we join the right party? And, and I, I do think that is very different from putting forward one case which you try and succeed on, which is going to fail, and making a late amendment to a different case which is going to succeed. Because it, Super Wolves claim the same claim. I'm the exclusive licensee, and that's my infringement, my right to be infringed. My lord, I, I, I do accept the difference, and you are right that the, 
the underlying cause of action is there. <clears throat> I, I'm not going to labour the joinder point again, you've heard me yeah. on that, but I do ask you to stand back and not understate the seriousness of what happened here. Well, that's your point. Um, and well, that that is your point. That that, 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 that is what Master Rolls has said. That, that, that is that, that, that fundamentally that is the that it that is the point. And either the judge what, where the judge went wrong, I say it was so serious in these circumstances that um, and it didn't have to be exceptional. I, and we're going to come to some as I I don't say that the court has to find it was an exceptional, but it was so serious um, that they should have been barred from amending. But if they weren't, then they should have get the cost sanction as, I've, uh, as I'm addressing you now. Summers, my lord, um, I said you'll find that uh, tab um, 18. Um, factually different um, insofar as this was a, uh, a claimant who um, had obtained a judgment with respect to personal injuries and then... Um, overstated um, dishonestly the nature of his injuries and exaggerated um, his claim uh, for damages um, and um, you'll see um, the court refused to strike out uh, the claim but it said at 53 in the ordinary way the judge should penalise the dishonest and fraudulent claimant and costs prospects of such orders is likely to be a real deterrent to people who want to do this in the future. Yes. So you say we should. Absolutely. Um, um, this is the second time I'm here before this court. The first to overturn a summary judgment that should never have been obtained. It was a fraudulent yes. attempt to yes. get a summary judgment. Yes. And to that end... And you, um, I'm I, sure my lord remembers, but I've forgotten yes. on what basis you overturned the summary judgment. Well, the... Is I it on this basis? It was yes. It was on the basis of Mr. Craig had given Mr. Mr. Craig had given us evidence mm -hmm. that um, firstly gave rise to the case on the trust. Although that was the element that my lord said, well, I'm just giving you that by way of a narrow margin. I'll give you the references in a minute. But the Mr. Craig's evidence also suggested that the light peak assignment was true. But it also highlighted the real problem with the bridge assignment. And if I may, because I do want to remind particularly um, my lord Sir Christopher Floyd, as to what the Court of Appeal um, found in that case. Um, and you'll find the Court of Appeal judgment behind tab 16. Um, and you the finished, relevant... You finished with Summers. Uh, I'll come back to Summers in a minute, my lord, because right. I don't, I think, okay. um, in fact, unless the Master of the Rolls requires anything else, I think you've, you've got my point on Summers. I think I've got Summers. Yes, you've got Yes, um, yes the Court of Appeal, um, the, what you said, my lord, um, uh, in your judgment, <coughs> where do we find that? Uh, you'll find you find the court of appeal behind tab sixteen. In the authorities. In the authorities, yes. yes got it. Yeah. Um, and you dealt with the the case, and this was all on the fresh evidence from Mr. Craig, because my clients are coming to this ignorant as to what happened years before, um, and relying on his evidence. And um, you you deal with it, it's really paragraph seventy one onwards. 71. Um, 71 of the judgment, page 205 of the bundle. Um, and paragraph 71, you found that on the fresh evidence there was a tribal issue with respect to the light peak assignment. Um, 73 is what I specifically want to highlight, and 74 with what you said, my lord, as to the fictitious bridge assignment. Because you found that there were serious grounds to doubt whether that had happened in light of the fresh evidence. And at 74, that was notwithstanding Mr. Middleton coming to this court and giving false evidence. So you go really so far as to say, do you, that if we don't penalise these people in cost for bringing a false claim, who on earth are we going to? Yes. I mean, let, and let's, and if I may, and I get criticised sometimes for being a bit too theatrical, but let's not understate the dishonesty no, you've um, been anything but theatrical. The, this is a case where um, they've not just lied to this court and to the judge below. No. They lied to the IPO. Mm. No, I get all this. Mm. Um, in my, and this is why we say ground one. You may think it's exceptional, 
But this is except if this court does not send a message, mm -hmm. then everyone can come before and say, well, I, you know what? I can bring a knowingly dishonest claim um, and Still conspire to do it for years. I can get a summary judgment against someone. I can look to commit a, another party. I can come before the Court of Appeal and lie. I can then lie and lie and lie. And guess what? When you finally expose me, I can then just say, all right, I'm sorry, hold my hands up, and I'm just going to plead an answer. I mean, the judge's perception of this was that super war should not be effectively um, uh, victimised for the fraud that was primarily that of Christ. Yes. And what do you say about that? Well, I think he was approaching it from the similar position to my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Nuji. Um, Superwall and, and Middleton was a director of Superwall. Yes, he was a sole director, giving the instructions. And, and do you, I mean, you'll need to show me, if you say this, that Middleton and Price conspired effectively to bring this false claim. Is that what the facts were? Well, the judge finds, the judge finds at 68, uh, when he deals with the evidence of Price and Middleton at 66 through to 69, of uh, the liability judgment, that's page 38 and 39 of my core bundle. You may need to add 39 pages to that. I don't think I do it now. That's fine. <coughs> okay. He finds Price knowingly knows. So, which paragraphs? Uh, Price is at 66 and 67. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, record, he, he records, and at 68 and 69, he also finds that Middleton knew at the time that this was, he, the way he puts it is, he was an active part in making the application. I think that it is unlikely that he thought there had been such an assignment, and it must have been known that it would be contrary to the view of the parties to be concluded. Um, and, um, and then he, uh, that point of 69 that Mr. Grime, previously in counsel on the other side, had taken was shown to be um, something that was against his credit, credibility. So the judge, I mean, is, has, has the um, any thought? I mean, you know, this is the kind of case where judges send papers to the director of public prosecution, don't they? They, they do indeed. Um, that, that I'm not happened. aware that Judge Caddick has done that. Um, um, this court may want to do that, mm -hmm. um, but this is a case, and this is the point why. Why? And it was this was specifically confirmed in evidence. Mr. Middleton confirmed. That he had given the instructions on behalf of Superwall right. to so you've Mr. Got a transcript, have you, which has been found to be a clear lie? Um, well, I, I haven't got it, but I, I, I no, no, I mean you, you yeah, you, I, I, I got he, it. He confirmed well, under cross examination that he had specifically <coughs> instructed Mr. Festenstein to sign that statement of truth. Mm. Um, and of course, we've already we've already seen what the evidence that he'd said it to the Court of Appeal that is cited by Sir Christopher in his judgment. Uh, in the Court of Appeal. So, yeah, but by the time we, they were in the Court of Appeal, it had not been found after a trial no. uh, that this whole claim was based on a fraud. No. We, now it is. Now it is. Um, so, my Lord, I, it, it does come down to this. I can't move away from the point that Lord Justice Nuji has said as to the underlying cause of action. Yeah. But I do make the point that it is we shouldn't ignore the fact that they don't have standing to recover the relief unless they join the proprietor. And they took the conscious decision to stand by this fraud. They couldn't do anything else because having committed the fraud, and remember, and they, and they, they, Mr. Craig initially had sought to lay claim to this patent and they'd fa they foisted it off by the reference to this assignment. They have been lying about this for years. Um, Again, I come back to, it. this court has to send a message. Did they lie to the trustee? Yes. Where? Um, Where's the judge's finding? The judge the judge finds about Mr. Cray. The, um, I mean, there's a difference between simply not disclosing an asset and, and being expressly asked about it and saying, no, no, we've already... Paragraph 51, Lord. Thank you. Uh, 
that's different. That's saying, have you assigned anything? And Mr. Price didn't say, yes, I've assigned it to Mr. Bridge. Yeah, he, he, he not the... Um, true. Which was true, yes. <laughs> no, the... Hang on, let me get the relevant paragraph. The... Um, starts at 49 with respect to the failure to produce. Um, 50... Yes, here you go. Well, more 51 is he's asked to give details of any disposal of the assets. Um, he tells him it, it isn't. There, there, are, there, are, there isn't any. Um, the subsequent proceeding, and this is this is common ground. It may not be in the judgment, but the Mr. Brid, Mr. Craig brought proceedings, um, and they were <coughs> opposed um, on the basis that they'd been in a sign. The Yeah, you need to read what the let's say forty nine through to fifty seven. Well, unless I missed it, I don't remember seeing a statement that Mr. Craig asked Mr. Price what had happened to the patent. And yeah. Mr. Mr. Sorry, my Lord, 59, 55, 59. 55, 59. 55, 59. No, fifty five. Fifty five. Fifty five. Mr. Price. Wrote to Mr. Craig stating that the sale of my shares in Superwarp's David Bridge Joint Venture took and, mi and Mr. Bridge took place in March 2011. That was what he was saying about the transactions. Um, that sale of shares. Yes. Um, but not not to worry. Uh, if, if the judge doesn't deal with it, um, they, their case always has been that this is. That Happened. Yes, but that wasn't my my question. Was whether he made it he expressly Good. lied to the trustee, which is itself a, an offence under bankruptcy. Act, it is, act. but I mean he must have done because he told the trustee, "I've told you about all my assets," and he hadn't. Yeah. Uh, so he'd implicitly lied. <laughs> absolutely. Well, not implicitly. That's expressly. Yes. I mean, you every bankrupt has to sign a form saying, "I've told you about all my assets." Of course, it's a lie. If I remember correctly, the trustee, at some stage, applied to set aside. It can't have been the assignment. The, the trustee, the trustee. One of the problems with Mr. Craig's case was he was trying to, and this, his recollection, and you see what, how the judge deals with it. He brought a claim when he was the trustee, um, in which he. Um, was contrary to his current evidence that was before the court that it was owned by a partnership. Um, it was recognising that it had been a, a, an asset that had been assigned. Um, that, and you'll, you'll see that when he deals Mr. Craig's, Mr. Mr. Craig's evidence, which the judge said Mr. Craig was being honest, was at, is at 74 of the liability judgment. Um, my Lord, I'm conscious of the time. The, um, you've got the points that I make in the skeleton which I, I stand by um, in relation to grounds we've been discussing grounds one and three um, I mean the if I may just pick up some points uh, on those two grounds um, that my learned friend raises um, we've dealt with the, the substantive whether it's substantive or procedural point um, we discussed that um, they um, my learned friend says that, well, you know, this case, section 67, wasn't expressly pleaded, um, and had it been so, they would have amended, and they could have amended without a statement of truth. Um, now, we say that it, they knew that we were denying who the proprietor was. Um, yes, section 67.3 wasn't specifically put in our defence, but we, from the outset, said, you are not the proprietor, the proprietor is the trustee. Yeah. Of course, they know that they are lying. Um, and it is, in my submission, um, fanciful to suggest, one, that they would have applied to amend and say, oh, guess what, we've been lying for years, uh, but, you know, we're now going to say... I mean, all this is sort of technical twaddle, really. The, the, there are two points in the case. You say, gravity of fraud, no assignment, no, no amendment should be allowed. If amendment, they have to pay all the costs. 
that is the beginning and end of it, this appeal. And uh, you say, don't be spineless, because if you're spineless, uh, you're giving encouragement to fraudsters in the future. I'm glad you said that, about being spineless. I would not suggest that to you. I, I've not two. often been accused of being spineless, <laughs> but I understand it's possible. Uh, Lord, yeah. Uh, in, in, with respect, I, I say, yeah, well, if, we, if we are, if this isn't a case where the Court of Appeals should send a real we, message. We get that. Yeah. And you're not even being theatrical. Um, Lord, but, but we should you, probably. I mean, it, you know, if that really is the beginning and the end of this, and I'd all agree, we should probably give Mr. Knox a chance to explain why that's all nonsense. Before I do sit down, Lord, do you want to hear from me in relation to ground two and the construction of the charge and the license, which is. Um, You've got. I think you've you've got my art. You've got my We've case. Got it, it's either. I mean, I, I don't accept my little friend's pleading point. My submission to pleading covered it. Um, and the construction. Well, I mean, just don't really understand this one. It's got nothing to do with the charge. It's, it's the license. Yeah. And, and we pleaded that the license. You, you their say the exclusive licensee had no effectively no cause of action. Well, uh, I what I say is that by reference to the bilateral license, hmm. they had given supremacy. To Mr. Price. Now, they can do as a matter of contract, and that's what they've done, but it's a construction argument. You're either with well, me or does, you're not. What does supremacy mean? Uh, well, it, well, under clause 9.2 and 9.3 of the license, that basically they couldn't they couldn't sue to recover. Um, given up their right to damages. Uh, it, unless he had given the note given the notice that he wasn't interested, um, in effect. Um, and he never did that. And what we say, therefore, is is that the license gives him supremacy. Um, that therefore, um, to the extent that, and of course, his rights under the license are charged under the charge, mm. properly construed. Um, and it's only in so far as um, once the charge has been redeemed and it's admitted, there's a lot of money outstanding under that over that and caught by that charge. That Superwall has a right um, to recover. I can't really add to what I've said in the skeleton on that. Um, it is ground two. Um, my principal ground, obviously, is ground one, and fall back on ground two. Can I, can I just draw out, um, understand what you say the commercial effect is of, of your construction? <coughs> clause nine two and nine three. Fine. In, in a case in which Mr. Price doesn't give consent under nine three, yeah. to no good super wall claim. You say that only Mr. Price can claim damages. No, I, what I say is, is that um, the to the extent that the damages exceed what is owing under the charge. Yes, Mr. Price, but it's only Mr. Price's interest which has been charged. Yes, Superwall's interest no. hasn't been charged. It wasn't party to the charge. So, so your your this only operates as a defence if it enables you to say that unless notice has been given under clause 9.3, Superwall cannot sue you for damages. That, that is what you're saying. It, 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 can sue, it can sue, but it can't recover anything. It can't recover. It can only recover the surplus to the extent there's a surplus after the um, monies are owing under the charge. I think there's about 800,000 owing under that charge. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm still being... Stupid. I quite understood how this argument works. So in the absence of clauses 9.2 and 9.3, yeah. if a patentee grants an exclusive licensee an exclusive license, then by section 67, the exclusive licensee has a right to sue for damages for infringement. Yeah. We, we've, all, we've already seen that in order to succeed in that, he needs to join. But putting that on one side, he has a cause of action for damages. Yeah. Those damages will prima facie consist of, if he elects for damages rather than a count of profit, the extent to which his, the exclusive licensee's business, has suffered loss as a result of your infringing sale. Yes. Now, you, you accepted a moment ago that the effect of the charge was to charge Mr. Price's right to you to the charge you. Yes. And so if Mr. Price had a cause of action, which we know he doesn't, it would be limited, you say, because 
of circularity to the excessive <coughs> amount under, outstanding under the charge. <coughs> I think I'm having difficulty understanding is how that affects the superwoman's separate right to sue you for the damage that it has suffered by reason of your infringement. And I thought you were saying that the effect of clause 9.2 and 9.3 was that unless Mr. Price has given notice, which he hasn't, Superwall doesn't have a claim for damages, he's given it up. But that wasn't the answer you gave. You, you, you gave an answer which suggested that Superwall's claim for damages subsists, but is limited to the excess over the charge. And it's that that I'm having difficulty with. The Mr. Mr. Price's rights to recover. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> the license has given supremacy to the right to recover damages to Mr. Price. Yeah. Um, Superwall can sue for the sue um, for the damages in toto, but it's given up its rights to recover to retain the damages to Mr. Price, absent the notice. And he has charged those to the NWTIF. So Superwall can only recover if there's a surplus. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I can't really add to the, no, no, the arguments no, no, in the no, skeleton. No. My primary grounds are obviously one and yep. three. Um, Lords, if I can assist you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Knopf. And you're going to respond to that and open your cross appeal, right? Um, my Lord, yes. Can I, first of all, just deal with the point we were on, the construction point, while it's in your mind? It's, um, <coughs> my Lord, I submit it's manifestly wrong. Can I just take it to the relevant clauses? It's not just Clause 9. Uh, first of all, there's Clause 2.1 of the licence, which Where is. Where do we get? Uh, sorry? Where do we get? Um, court bundle 161 or 200. Fourteenth of October two thousand and eight. That's right. I think it's one six one. Forgive me, my lord. Um, I'm just uh, picking up the page myself. Uh, the license begins at one sixty or one nine nine, and then at one six one, you have two point one grant of rights, and I emphasise this in particular. PP has Mr. Price hereby grants to Superwall the exclusive right under the Superwall license rights to import, make, and so on and so forth, uh, supply Superwall licensed products in the territory, that's the UK and uh, Ireland, uh, for the term of this agreement, unless omitted uh, there, and on other terms and conditions together with the grant right to grant that license. And you'll see at the top of the page what Superwall licensed products are, and you'll see what Superwall licensed rights are. Um, and I say this is important because it is well known, and my lord, we recite you from the case of Nuremberg, what the purpose of section 67 of the Patents Act is. Um, the reference is at the authorities bundle, um, <coughs> page 128, <coughs> paragraph 22. The purpose, I, if I may just quote this from the Russian Lord Justice Arnold, the purpose of Section 67 is to enable an exclusive licensee to recover its own losses or share of infringer's profits in the event of infringement. That's the point, because before the statutory intervention, strictly speaking, an exclusive licensee simply had no rights. He was just a mere, as it were, licensee. He had a permit, but he had no right to sue third parties. But that's the purpose. And it's against that purpose which this contract has to be uh, construed. The whole point is to give him a right to sue by virtue of exclusive license. Mm -hmm. um, then you go to clause 7, which is at page 163 or 202. The license fee, I don't, don't propose to read through all of it, but 7.1, in consideration of the rights granted under 2.1 and the provision by PP of know-how pursuant to 2.6, Superwall shall pay to PP 60% of all revenues received by Superwall by reason of its exploitation, I emphasize exploitation, of the Superwall license rights. So that's what, on the face of it, um, Mr. Price's rights are. 60% of exploitation, query whether that covers damages for infringement, that's a different point. But that's 
the fundamental right Mr. Price has, and I respect it, but one has to construe clause 9.1 in the light of the extent of Mr. Price's rights in settlement. Because what my learned friend's argument comes down to is if there's an infringement, and my client, or super rather, sues for damages for infringement, <coughs> then in fact, on his case, Mr. Price can uh, just swoop in and say, I'm having the lot, thank you very much. In my submission, that's a rather odd construction, bearing in mind, A, there's an exclusive license where the rights that Mr. Price has are simply limited to taking, um, I think it's 60% of the exploitation. So on the face of it, it's difficult to see how Clause 9 should be read in the way my learned friend suggests. We then go to Clause 9, um, page 164, 203, 9.1. And my lords, if I may just briefly just run through what is going on in my submission. If Superwall detects or suspects any infringement, misappropriation or misuse of the Superwall license rights, it shall promptly notify PP and provide all details uh, within its knowledge with respect to the same. PP and Superwall shall as soon as practical consult to decide what steps to be taken to prevent such infringement. So there's a, so a, what you might call a cooperation clause. 9.2. PP and Superwall shall take all steps as may be agreed by them in pursuance of Clause 9.1, including the institution of legal proceedings where necessary in the name of one of the parties or in the joint names of PP and Superwall as appropriate. Again, effectively a, a cooperation clause. Now the reason I emphasise 9.1 and 9.2 as being what you might call cooperation clauses is my learned friend's construction renders them pretty well worthless. As Mr Price on his construction can say, I'm sorry, I'm feeling very cooperative, but I want all the money, or whatever. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, then you go to clause 9.3. If PP notifies Superwall that he does not intend to take any action or fails within a reasonable period of the circumstances to take such steps as may be considered necessary, appropriate by Superwall, uh, whether or not agreement has been reached in uh, pursuance of 9.1, Superwall shall have the right and is hereby authorised by PP to take those steps independently. And I pause there for the moment. This is what this clause is doing. It's saying, look, if I don't get back to you, or if I tell you I'm not interested, you can carry on on your own. It's just, a, if you like, an exception to the cooperation clause. If I'm being uncooperative, you can carry on on your own. Then continues, in doing so, Superwall shall not be taken as acting as agent or in any way on behalf of PP, <coughs> but PP shall give all reasonable assistance at Superwall's expense to facilitate any proceedings. Superwall shall bear all costs, but shall be entitled to retain for its own absolute benefit any damages, costs, or other expenses. Now, my lord, I respectfully submit all that makes perfect sense. It doesn't follow from that clause um, that if Mr. Price does express an interest or says I want all of it, um, then Superwall has no rights. It just doesn't follow at all. And my lord, that is, in my submission, the short answer to the construction. If I can turn to the um, section 67 point, uh, I'm not dealing with the costs of section 67, I'm just dealing with the section 67 point. Just, my lord, some general points, which I submit it is important to bear in mind um, uh, my, my, my learned friend's submissions. And these are obvious points of common ground, but I want to emphasize them. Section 67.1 gives an exclusive licensee a statutory right to bring a claim. Section 67.3 requires the patent holder to be joined to the proceedings, but the court has jurisdiction to join the patent holder at any time, if for whatever reason he has not been joined at the beginning. And finally, if the patent holder is joined, it is common ground that the proceedings are retrospectively validated. You don't just say, well, until now they've been invalid and nullity, but they're valid only for now. They are retrospectively treated as validated, they are not a nullity. Where, where do you get that from? I think it's common ground. In fact, the judge mentions that. He says it was common ground that the proceedings were not a nullity uh, before um, the um, joint up. Well, they're not a nullity before, but that no. doesn't sort of make them retrospectively validated. They're not invalid before. Yes. Well, my, my, my lord, I agree there may be a difference. I, I, I may be going too far to so say they're validated in toto, because, of course, there may be cost questions. That's a different point. But, the, but, the, but once the joinder has been effective, the court can continue and give whatever remedies are appropriate. 
I mean, once the jointer takes place, then the proceedings carry on. Yeah. They, 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 they carry on. And, and whatever relief could have been given the court can mm. now be given. But I mean, none of that really affects whether you should be, if I can use the term loosely, punished <laughs> for having deceived the court heinously in the way you have. Not you personally. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my Lord, it's also common ground, and I just want to emphasise this, that CPR 19.2 gives the power to join at any stage. Yes. And we quote from the Pablo Star in the authorities bundle, it's at page 293, at paragraph 26. My Lord, I don't need to take you to that, but it confirms also that joinder can be effective after judgment given, uh, certainly before damages are awarded. Yeah. Um, my Lord, the only question, therefore, I know, my Lord, I'm coming to your point, the only question is, did the judge go wrong in law, fail to take into account relevant factors and so forth, or just go manifestly wrong, in making the order, the cost order, that he made, or at least in allowing joinder to take place? That's the question. Two questions. Those are two questions. They're related, <coughs> but they are the question. And in my submission, I know it's, it's old hat, but I do submit it's important just to see exactly how tough this test is. And one, if I may take you to the authorities, bundle at page 42, I think. At paragraph 20. Which case? Uh, this is the case of, uh, I think it's called appeal decision. ABP Technology, uh, and it's in the judgment, I think, of Justice Burke. And paragraph 21 on page 42, um, principles applied on appeal from the exercise of discretion have been addressed in many cases. I will only refer to the useful recent summary by Mr. Justice Saini in Azam. Uh, an appellate court will only interfere with a discretionary evaluation. My Lord, that I submit is exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, where an appellant can identify one or more of the following errors. One, a misdirection in law. Two, some procedural unfairness or irregularity. Three, taking into account relevant matters. Four, failing to take into account relevant matters. Four, making a decision that's plainly wrong. And then error type five means a decision which has exceeded the generous ambit within which reasonable disagreement is uh, uh, possible. And then over the peg, the appellate's, the appellate court's role is to police a very wide perimeter, and it will be rare that a judge who has exercised the discretion having regard to relevant considerations will have come to a conclusion outside that perimeter. It needs to be underlined that the appellate court in an appeal, such as the present, is exercising uh, CPR 52.21 review. It is also well established that the weight to be given to specific facts is a matter for the trial judge. Now, you, can, well, you can see why I'm emphasising it's all old hat, I agree, but it's important to bear in mind. And absent some wholly unjustifiable <coughs> attribution of weight, <coughs> and the public court must defer to the trial judge. Now, I emphasise that because I just want to make one obvious point at the beginning. What the judge has done, he has most certainly taken into account the fraud he found Mr Price had committed. He, he says, you must pay costs on the indemnity basis. I'll come later on to my own points on the appeal, but he has undoubtedly said Mr. Price must pay the cost of the indemnity basis. And as far as my learned friend's appeal goes, the real question is, did he let off Super Bowl too lightly? That's what it comes down to. And in my submission, there's no reason at all for interfering with the judge's uh, exercise of discretion, either A, in allowing um, uh, Super Bowl to join the trust, Nothing wrong with his exercise of discretion there. And secondly, nothing wrong with his discretion in saying that for the reasons he gives, Super Bowl should not have to pay all the costs of the action up to and including uh, the amendment. Well, I should just emphasize this. The judge does, of course, say that Super Bowl must pay for the costs of the amendment introducing the trustee. Yeah, what, what reason does he give for um, disregarding Summers? Well, he doesn't. He, uh, far from it. He likes Summers. He says he's adopting Summers. He says, I've looked at Summers, and I take the view that, um, uh, uh, just as in Summers, the fraudulent claimant wasn't debarred, my lord, uh, 
at the moment I'm on the discretion to join as opposed to the cost one. The fraudulent claimant in Summers um, that wasn't debarred from bringing his action and claiming the damages up to the level that, he, that was justifiable merely by his fraudulent exaggeration. And the judge says, well, so here too, Superwar are, uh, he does accept that Superwar have taken part uh, in, giving the, in the giving of false evidence. But he says that of itself does not justify debarring Superwar. I mean, didn't from he disregard the words of Lord Clark? It is entirely appropriate in a case of this kind to order the claimant to pay the cost of any part of the process which has been caused by his fraud or dishonesty, and moreover to do so by making orders for costs on an indemnity basis. It seems to the court that the prospect of such orders is likely to be a real deterrent. And well, since both Superwar and um, uh, Mr. Price. Price were part of the fraud, why shouldn't they both be mulched in costs for the whole of the process, which was basically a deception of the court? Oh, my Lord, I, I, of course, this is on the as a cost point as opposed to the joint. So I can deal with your lordship's question. Well, it's question. really the same point. Uh, the, well, they're, they're related. I clearly, I clearly, they're not necessarily the same, but I certainly accept. I mean, one might say that, um, that, that this authority leads you to believe that the correct penalty is costs, not joinder. In other words, that it would be a strong thing to say that we're not going to adjudicate on the real rights of the parties to damages for infringement or to the infringement um, but uh, the, on the question of costs I'm asking you why hasn't this really been set to one side? My Lord word you used in citing your clerk judgment your correct word was caused by mm -hmm. caused by ah the foundation of the judge's judgment in relation to Super Bowl and I'm speaking off the top of my head for I've got a reference somewhere, is he says this action would always have been vigorously resisted in any event. Mm -hmm. There is no basis for saying that the failure to join the trustee earlier has resulted in any added costs at all. That, that and my Lord, that is a, an assessment which he was, of all people, the best place to know. He's heard these people. Today. You say the 60% that he ordered was what he said was caused by, and the rest of it was not. Yes, and therefore he, you shouldn't interfere with the discretion. Well, I've got my own appeal, of course, about the errors he makes there, but I, that's a different point. I know I'm going to be hammered with all the things I say and answer, and so so. But, <coughs> but um, <coughs> I do say, uh, in relation to costs, the words, and indeed joinder, the words caused by. Now, what the judge has essentially found, and again, I'm speaking without reference to my notes, but in relation, what he has essentially found is the joinder could always have taken place much earlier. And everything would have taken place exactly as it did. So the failure to join has made absolutely no difference. That being the case, two things follow. Absolutely no difference to what? How the case was conducted and what costs were incurred. But that's not right. I mean, it makes a big difference to how the case is conducted because you've got a false pleading and a, a, a matter being tried uh, based on lies. But you're entitled to say, yes, the infringement claim would have had to proceed defended for all the bases it was. But should the court not mark the fact that a, a claim is brought based on lies, based on perjury, based on a criminal offence, um, by saying that if you choose to come to court, with these very dirty hands, the court is going to make sure that you get nothing out of it. That's, Lord, what, that's no. what Mr. Maynard Connor is submitting. My Lord, I submit that is not the effect of something. But I, submit, uh, I understand, of course, what your Lordship is putting to me. But I, I do emphasize the difference between Superwall and Mr. Price. There's no doubt that Mr. Price's claim, he must pay costs of the indemnity, but he must pay costs full stop. And of course, my Lord, there are other sanctions. This is a point made in Summers. There are other sanctions as well which the court can impose. But what's wrong? Why is Superwall different when Superwall's um, only director and shareholder, is it, um, conspired with Mr. Price to, to, to 
conduct this deceit on the court. Because Soupwall's own claim was a good claim. Doesn't matter. Well, he still deceived the court. My lord, that it assisted in the deceit of the court in relation to Mr. Price's claim. But, but it's you only assist in deceit. You get you get that off with a, with well, a, with a <laughs> slap <laughs> wrist. But if well, you actually, uh, hmm? I, I accept that. One. But the point is Superwall's own claim. This is the point of the summons. Mm. Superwall's own claim was actually a perfectly good claim. The only thing that was wrong with Superwall's own claim per se, as brought in this case, was they didn't join in the trustee. That's yeah. it. <coughs> now, my lord, if, let us say, there had been some reason for saying, and the judge had found, well, if you'd joined the trustee in earlier, things would have gone very differently, then, of course, that might be a reason for disallowing the joinder or, or for ordering costs up until the joinder. But the judge's finding was precisely to the reverse. He has said in practice, A, this joinder point was never taken by anyone. And my lord, I might add, not even by him, until he gets around to writing his judgment. It is, in real life, a procedural point which comes in right at the end of limited, if I may put it this way, substantive, significance, precisely because it is a matter that can be cured. The next stage is, should I cure it? And if <coughs> prejudice is caused to anyone, and in particular, if the trustee or the official receiver says, I'm totally laid back, I have no interest in these proceedings, as he did, as he showed that he didn't like, then in my submission, there's no reason at all not, in the first instance, to allow the jointer. Indeed, it would be... say it's a sort of fortuity, really, that... Um, this came to light uh, because the judge noticed it late, but didn't make any difference to Superwall's, the validity of Superwall's no. claim. So to punish Superwall, even if they lied and cheated, is not appropriate. What you say is that if uh, there are to be, if there's to be punishment, it should be perjury or some other yes. um, appropriate sanctions taken for the lying. My Lord, that is the purpose of, that's the point of summary. And my lord, perhaps I, can I just show you certain yes, passages of some yes, Because it's, 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 it is a judgment which I, I did spend some time looking at. Yes. Uh, and it, it does, because obviously the issue, <laughs> I remind your lordship of what happened. Uh, there was an accident at work. The claimant uh, put in a claim for about £800,000 of. Uh, eventually he got about, I think actually it was, was an injury of about ninety-nine or £100,000 of. Um, but he grossly exaggerated the extent of his injuries and their effect. And the surveillance was put on him by the defendant insurers in the usual way, which had, you know, had filled with him playing football and all the rest of it. Um, <laughs> which was slightly inconsistent with his account that he was unable to move. And so, of course, uh, a large part of his claim was held to be fraudulently exaggerated. Yes. But, in fact, three quarters fraudulently exaggerated, if you look at the figures. But there was a good part. Uh, the judge, at first instance, said, well, I'm, I'm going to give damage, I'm going to award the damages, whatever they were. Uh, the Court of Appeal upheld that because they regarded themselves as bound by previous Court of Appeal authority, uh, not to strike out merely because of a fraudulent exaggerated claim. But the matter then goes up to the Supreme Court. And they give a lot of consideration to what exactly are the, what, what's the point? And essentially what they land up saying is, it's only in very exceptional, I think they actually use the word very exceptional circumstances, that you should strike out uh, a claim once the action has taken place. But almost on a never say never basis. But they discuss the problems to which these types of claims give rise. And they, and they also discuss the principle uh, which should apply. And my lord, if, my lord, if you ask me what is, in a word or two, the principle which applies, it is this. If my conduct as a fraudulent claimant has made it impossible, really, for a fair trial to take place, let's say, for example, I've just withheld documents, or whatever it is, it's always impossible to work out what the truth of the matter is, then, in my submission, one can well see that at the end of the day, a court might say, your conduct has made it impossible for there to be a fair trial, so I'm just going to dismiss your claim. You may or may not be right in what you say, but I just can't, it's not a fair trial. <coughs> Those are the <coughs> circumstances where I do accept. Uh, but conversely, if a fair trial is possible, um, the, the claim would not normally be dismissed. Exactly. There are other remedies. And then you go on to 
say um, that the case shows you that it's not inevitable, even in the circumstances where the claim is not dismissed, that the penalty and costs will be everything. Of the time and after the judge. Yeah. Yeah. Having taken into account the relevant, as long as, by law, I accept this, you must be, um, uh, you, if, unless you can say the judge has actually taken into account of relevant matters or gone wrong in principle and law, my lords, you may say I don't agree with this, but that's my submission, not the case. No, I get uh, that, and, but, uh, uh, but it could be that it's so heinous and an omission not to um, and penalise heavily uh, for an action based on a completely fraudulent premise uh, that the judge has not taken into account a material factor. One could, but in this case, because the judge found, and I submit there can't be any interference with this, because the judge found uh, that the action would have proceeded exactly as it would have done had the trustee in bankruptcy been joined in, or the official receiver well, you say joined he in gave it appropriate weight, really. He gave it appropriate anyway. weight, yeah. Mm. And my lords, I do respectfully submit that it's causation that is so important. How much difference in real life did it make that the official receiver, the trustee in bankruptcy, wasn't in there at the beginning? <coughs> let us say, by way of amendment, let us say right at the beginning. If the answer, and the judge, the effect of the judge's judgment is this is the answer. If the answer is it makes absolutely no difference to the way people have conducted the litigation, it certainly has an imperative of the fairness of the trial, then he's entitled to exercise his discretion, A, by joinder, B, by making uh, super, by, by making awards against super wall as well as the price on costs. But there's no reason for saying that he was bound in law to go further. And I accept what my learned friend says, and of course uh, the Master of Realms has, in one sense, adopted this, saying we must send the message loud and clear to people. I haven't people. adopted anything. Well, uh, when I say adopted... Um, uh, put it back to him. Put it back. And also, of course one understands that, but one has also to be rather careful about interfering with the judges' exercise of their discretion when they know the people they're dealing with. Now, could I just mention this point? My learned friend has said conspiracy to defraud. Now, my lords, my lords, that is quite a strong allegation. It's not actually what the judge found. Uh, I don't think that was ever put either. But in my submission, one has to be careful in deciding what the level of heinousness is. There is no doubt, perhaps I can just deal with this and give you all the references, there is no doubt that the judge is, is highly critical of both Mr. Price and Mr. Middleton. But one has to ask, what about at the point where he issued proceedings? What well, about that, what? Well, he doesn't say. What about what? At the point when they issued proceedings. Mm. What he does find is that the bridge assignment was a fiction. That's back in 2000, I think I'd like to say 2011. What he does not actually go on to say is that when they issued proceedings, which was in 2018, they put their heads together to put forward a fraudulent case. It doesn't make that finding. And in my submission, it's not open to this court. It not having been found by the judge, uh, and as far as I'm aware, not having been put to the judge, uh, to, to approach the matter on that basis. Well, I mean, is there very much difference between signing false statements of truth um, in a claim brought jointly by two claimants and putting your heads together to issue a fraudulent case? My lords, if, if that was a fraudulent statement of truth, again, the judge didn't find that. It's all a matter of timing. Well, I, 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 don't think, I don't think you can say that he didn't think the statement of truth was wrong. Well, ah. he, he does make some findings as, as to just, uh, the price might have Yes. Might have persuaded but, himself. Yeah, for might have come to believe yes. that, that there'd been an assignment. Uh, and my lords, one does have to be rather careful. I'm, I've, picked, I've picked up the references. Can I just take you to them? Where the judge refers to their state of mind yeah. and what it was at various different times. And the first reference I have, I think I might have said, is at page 32 of the core bundle, paragraph 42, or page 71. Um, uh, it begins at 42, uh, and then, uh, forgive me, I'm not quite sure why I've given this reference. Uh, 
may be 42 to 44. I'm not sure. I, I, it may be a bad deal there. Uh, sorry, a, 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 ba a bad point there. Um, he discusses, ah, oh, this is it, paragraph 46, he discusses Mr. Price's evidence mm -hmm. about the dealings with Mr. Bridge at 46. He then goes on to deal with 47 with Mr. Middleton's explanation, and he doesn't particularly comment on it there. Um, but then I think the paragraph 57, sorry, did you comment? Sorry, 48, forgive me. Oh, yes, 48, forgive me, that's it. On this basis, it seems inherently unlikely. But as at 28th of March, Mr. Price would have been looking for a deal with Mr. Bridge. In particular, given that ownership of patents was a key part of the deal, it's inherently unlikely that he would have entered an assignment, etc. A number of other factors. And my lords, those aren't actually really findings of dishonesty. But the, I think the first passage where this is uh, made is at paragraph 57, on page 36 of mm -hmm. Electronic 7. For these reasons, I conclude that there was, in fact, no assignment of patents to Mr. Bridge prior to Mr. Price's bankruptcy. The alleged assignment was, as the defendants submit, a fiction created in an attempt to keep the patents out of the hands of Mr. Price. Well, that Trust sounds like right. fraud, doesn't it? Oh, certainly. But the question, the question at that point, <laughs> I'm not denying that, but I'm talking about the, the, the statement of truth, the, what you might call the deliberate uh, concoction of a case seven years later. Um, and then later, I think page um, uh, 38 or 77, paragraph 67, is the passage by uh, Lord, Lord, New, Lord Justice Nuji referred to, um, about eight lines down, 67. More serious as regards his, that is Mr. Price's credibility, was his claim to have assigned the patents to Mr. Bridge on 28th of March, 2011. Whilst it's possible that by the time of his trial he might have come to his earlier dealings with Mr. Bridge had included an assignment, he cannot have thought that in 2011 when he first claimed to have made it. So he is... But as I've indicated, I believe this story was made up in an oh, attempt yes. to keep the patents out of the hands of his trustee in bankruptcy and therefore of his creditors. I mean, oh, yes. I, I don't perhaps understand the criminal mind as much as criminal lawyers, but I don't understand how you can forget having made something like that up. Well, my lord, except he says that um, I think it's possible by the time of this trial he might have come to believe his earlier dealings had included. But my lord, it was all quite complicated. Um, I don't know how far you dug into the judgment itself, but it was quite it was quite a complicated set of transactions. And I there find, were I find the fraud quite simple. Ah, Mr. Um, Knox. It, it, indeed, but of course, if there are lots of different transactions, it is the judge okay. anyway has held. My lord, I I stand by what the judge says. It is possible he may have uh, uh, he may he may have might have come to believe that the earlier dealings had included an assignment. My lord, that is the point I'm on. It's, I'm not, a, it's not a ringing acquittal, is it? Not a ringing acquittal, no, obviously not. But on the other hand, it's not you two, at the time you served these proceedings, you put your heads together to put forward what you both knew to be a fraudulent claim. Not you would point out that it's uh, a finding on the balance of probability. Does he not make some other findings on the cost? He awards indemnity what? in relation against Mr. Price. Against Mr. Price, so that must have been based on his, taking a rather dim view of Mr. Price's behaviour. Oh, Mr. Price's behaviour certainly. Well, but my, my lord, I don't want to. I, I, I just want. To, I just want the point about conspiracy to defraud at the point of issue in the yes. claim. That is really what I'm simply saying. There was no finding to that effect, and one has to be rather careful, given what the judge himself has said in his judgment. Um, uh, and it's not open to this court in my submission to go further than to act upon what the judge himself did find. Uh, my lord, the other passage, just for your notice, but I think my learned friend took it to it, paragraph 68 on page 39 or 78, where he deals with Mr. Middleton, <coughs> unsatisfactory evidence. He says, I, whilst I can understand that his recollection at trial was affected by the fog of time and the lo lack of documentation, he was an active party in making the, uh, 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 an application to UCAPO based on the claim there had been an assignment back in 2011. I think it's unlikely that he thought there had been such an assignment, and he must have known the contrary to the deal, including with Mr. Rich Jones. That is the 2011. So, 
Can I ask you, um, we were told by Mr. Men O'Connor that, that Mr. Milden had become the majority shareholder of Super Rugby. Was, was Mr. Price, did Mr. Price ret retain any interest? It would have gone to a trustee, wouldn't it? Uh, no, I think before, I think that alteration. Mr. Talk, Bridge. Uh, no, I think, my Lord, if I can just dig up my uh, chronology, I have a feeling this took place. Um, Mr. Price ceased to be a director of Super Bowl before his insolvency. And at some point thereafter, Mr. Middleton became the principal director and the main shareholder. Uh, the judge does deal with this. <coughs> um, uh, my, so, but I think by the time of the um, proposed supplement, but certainly by the time of the action, that was the position. Yeah, by the time of the action, Mr. Price had no interest. I'm fairly sure, I can double check, but there's no suggestion that he did have any interest. The interest appears to be in Mr. Middleton, who I think is described by the judge at one point as, quote, the majority shareholder and the sole director. My Lord, can I just, um, uh, I, I do have a note in the back of this. Um, <coughs> Judge deals with the uh, these matters, I think, at page in his judgment uh, at paragraph fourteen. Which judgment? I think in his main judgment, working from the Flipcraft appeal, it's paragraph fourteen. Fourteen to sixteen. <coughs> Page twenty four sixty three. It's paragraph sixteen, excuse me. Footnote. That's as far as the matter is taken. So, my Lord, I was just on the point about the conspiracy. I say that's not open to this court to find. The judge doesn't go that far. He certainly says, back in 2011, they put their heads together to create a fiction. When he's coming to discuss their state of mind at the trial, he's rather more equivocal. <coughs> he doesn't say, which of course is in 2022, he doesn't, as it were, make any findings as to what their, their state of mind was as at the date of the issue of the Super Bowl. And I submit, my Lord, it was not open to this court either. That's, that's the only point I'm trying to make. Um, my Lord, I was going to go, I think, to summons. Yes. Um, and the first passage, it's at tab 18 of the authorities' summons. Um, I just wanted to go to is at, I think paragraph 30, 262 uh, because what the Supreme Court does is it reviews previous Court of Appeal authorities and it refers to one called Ul Haq the Shah in which I think it was all Justice Toulson and others had said the court after trial has no power to strike out at all but what I do uh, uh, submit is, is important is what is said in paragraph 30. In Ulhaq v. Shah, the submission that the court should not have proceeded to give judgment on the claims but could and should have struck out the whole claim for the use of the process was rejected. The inclusion of a false claim with a genuine claim or claims does not of itself turn a genuine claim into a false one or justify <coughs> striking out a genuine claim. To do so would be to deprive a claimant of his substantive rights as a mark of disapproval, which the court has no power to do. Not a case, uh, like Arrow, where the conduct of the litigant put the fairness of the trial in jeopardy, even in the broadest sense, in which case the claim might be struck out as an abuse of process, but a case in which it was not suggested that there could not be a fair trial of the claim. Now, by the way, all Hark was actually disapproved in, in one narrow sense by the Supreme Court, which the Supreme Court said 
Well, there may be a jurisdiction for strike up <laughs> at the end. But I refer to that there as a good example of where one could reasonably say uh, there should be a strike out, or in a case such as this, I'm not going to allow a joinder to take place because that means there's not been a fair trial. Um, uh, moving on. Paragraphs 43 to 44. This was a different authority uh, called the Appeal Authority, which is referred to Massoud v. Sahor. We agree with the Court of Appeal in Mahoud, Massoud, uh, that while the Court has power to strike out a claim at the end of the trial, it would only do so if it was satisfied that the party's abuse of the process was such that he had thereby forfeit, forfeited the right to have his claims heard. My lords, I emphasize that because they agree with that. So that is the test in my submission. Sorry, which paragraph are you on? I'm terribly sorry, my lord. Um, 43, page right. 266. Thank you. And my lord, at the moment I'm on the joinder point as opposed to the cost point. But I submit this is important. Uh, it's a good, good indication of the sort of thing which might justify non-joinder. Had, had Superwall had Super forfeited its right to have its claim to say, but I say there's, it's plainly, uh, the judge was plainly well within his right to say, no, uh, it didn't justify striking out. Yeah. Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, said that this is a largely theoretical possibility because it must be a very rare case <coughs> which at the end of the trial it would be appropriate <coughs> for a judge to strike out a case uh, rather than dismiss it judgment on the merits of the way, we agree and would add that the same is true where, as in this case, the court is able to assess both the liability of the defendant and that liability. And my lord, I say that is the underlying, certainly one of the underlying principles, but that principle, uh, on that principle, the judge's judgment of the joinder was, in my submission, plainly correct. Um, one then goes on to 44, I should say, because we've considered whether the possibility is so theoretical that it should be rejected beyond the powers of the court. However, it was ultimately accepted on behalf of the claimant that one should never say never to confirm the different judgment in the whole uh, The next passage I would like to take you to is at 49, uh, paragraph 49, over the page, 267. Um, and it's halfway down the page in the paragraph meaning the draconian step. The draconian step of striking a, a claim out is always a last resort. A fortiori where to do so would be to deprive the claimant of a substantive right to which the court had held that he was entitled after a fair trial. Very difficult to think of circumstances in which such a conclusion would be brought, but such circumstances might, however, include a case where there had been a massive attempt to deceive the court but the award of damages would be very small. Not worth the candle, as it were. But my lord, we're not in that case. Uh, it was submitted uh, on behalf of uh, the... Do, we, do, do, you, do you have any position as to what the likely award of damages might well, be? Well, I, I didn't appear for those, so I'm not entirely... I'm not uh, as familiar with the case as others. But I did receive a note which said about 300 to 400,000 pounds and maybe more. <coughs> just by Super Bowl? Just, just, just by Super Bowl. And damages. Damages, yes. <coughs> the, there is a, an argument one would have thought that Super Bowl would be limited to 40% of the loss uh, on the basis that, that 60% would have belonged to Mr. Price. There is that argument, but that wasn't before the court. No. That, would be, that would go to but, damages. But, but is that 300,000? That's, that's 100%. Of the I think, I, I'd have to check, but I think it's 100%, not, not taking into account the 60% exploitation. That have to go to, my lord. I've, met, I've mentioned before query whether exploitation yes, yes, covers yes. the claim and damages. Account of profits, probably, but damages for infringement, maybe not. That's a different point. But it's not before this court. But even if you knock it back by 60%, it's still a six figure sum. <coughs> okay. Um, my Lord, I was, get, I was just, just going back to Summers. It was paragraph 50. It was submitted on behalf of the defendant. It's necessary to use the power to strike out the claim in circumstances of this kind in order to deter fraudulent claims of the type made by the claimant in the instant case because they are all too prevalent. This is a, sending out a message loud and clear. 
And of course, it's a point that one understands. But the Supreme Court obviously urges some restraint on this. We accept that all reasonable steps should be taken to deter them. However, there is a balance to be struck. To date, the balance has been struck by assessing both liability and quantum, and provided that those assessments can be carried out fairly, to give judgment in the ordinary way. The reasons for that approach are explained by the court in Massoud and Bull Hall. 51. We accept that such an approach will be correct in the vast majority of cases. Moreover, we do not accept the submission that unless such claims are struck out, dishonest claimants will not be deterred. There are many ways in which deterrence can be achieved. They include ensuring that the dishonesty does not increase in the award of damages, making orders for costs, reducing interest, proceedings for contempt and criminal proceedings. Now, my Lord, that, in my submission, is the answer to my learned friend's submission on joinder, and indeed on costs. I'll come back more specifically to costs. That, that, in my submission, is what the Supreme Court is expressly saying should be the correct approach. Moving on, my Lords, um, page, I think, paragraph 61. test in every case must be what is just and proportional. It seems to us that it will only be in the very exceptional case. My Lord, I, this, the phrase exceptional often gives rise to difficulties. Very exceptional, my Lord, I submit means just that. Very exceptional case. That it will be just and proportionate for the court to strike out an action after trial. The appropriate course would be that of the Mahsoud and the Ohio. Judgment will be given the claim if the claim is based and established on the fact. All proper impulses can be drawn against the claim. He may be entitled to some costs, I emphasize that at the moment, but is likely to face a substantial order condemned to costs in respect of time wasted by his fortunate claims. Can I just emphasize that point again? Because it goes back to causation point. Five, it's the time wasted by his fraudulent claims. Now, when I ask in relation to Super Bowl, what time was wasted uh, by Super Bowl? Um, uh, the judge, of course, did take into account its support for. Price's claim. But the non joinder in my submission has added nothing to that. Uh, the defendant may, uh, may well <coughs> make a default back offer and so forth. Uh, moreover, it's open to the defendant to seek to bring contempt proceedings, like result in imprisonment. It seems to us the combination of these consequences is likely to be a very effective deterrent to claimants bringing dishonest or fraudulent claims, especially if uh, the risk being displayed by the solicitor. It further this, it further seems to us that it is in principle more appropriate to penalise such a claimant as a contender than to relieve the defendant of what the court has held to be a substantive liability. So, my Lord, again, I obviously emphasise that. That's the remedy, because what's being put to me is you behave very badly, but to which I say, well, Superwall didn't behave actually. Superwall did, to a certain extent, behave badly, but the remedy is not mulching it or taking its cause of action away or mulching it with costs. There are other remedies. Um, and then finally, uh, our, when they apply the matter to the facts, the, court, uh, the Supreme Court says it wouldn't be proportionate to deprive the claimant of his damages. Uh, and the summary, paragraph 65, uh, although we have accepted the defendant's submission that the court has power under the CPR and under its inherent jurisdiction to strike out a statement, at any stage of the proceedings, even when it's already determined that the claimant is in principle entitled to damages in an ascertained sum, we have concluded that the power should in principle only be exercised where it's just and proportionate to do so, which is likely to be only in very exceptional circumstances. So that, in my submission, is the correct approach this court should adopt, both on the joinder issue and on the cost issue, but especially on the joint issue. So obviously the cost issue, I can see, is not necessarily identical. If you apply the correct approach and take into account uh, the judge's own observations, the judge's own observations, I submit there, uh, it cannot be said that he has got anything wrong. And can I just, on the joint point, take you to what the judge actually said uh, on, on this? I think it's uh, <coughs> the core bundle. Does it make a difference? in your submission, Mr Knox, <coughs> that these observations are all made in the context of striking out, whereas what uh, is necessary for Superwall to succeed in this case is that the court give it the indulgence yeah. 
in the light of its conduct or of uh, a dis exercise of a discretion? In my submission, it, I can see that you might say there is a difference, because I'm, I'm asking for the court's indulgence, as it were, as opposed to resisting, uh, uh, whereas I've already got a complete cause of action. I can see there is a difference, but in my submission, the principles which are set out in Summers do not justify making any difference, a, a, any distinction, where it is clear, as the judge held, that the failure to join is a procedural matter, which no one noticed until right at the very end. Uh, I, I accept that it might be said we're talking about a discretion, mm. but the discretion in my submission should be exercised in accordance with the principles of Summers. Uh, and as long as um, uh, the principles lead to a clear result, and I submit they obviously do, then the joinder can properly be made. But well, can I just ask you to look at the judge? Because I submit it's a careful judgment. The judge was obviously very aware of the importance of this point. It's at um, page 83, I think. Uh, of the four bundle. <coughs> or, uh, the passage actually begins at page 81, paragraph 16. Which paragraph? Uh, six, page 81, paragraph 16 onwards. Um, page 81 or 120. Judge sets out um, the rights of the exclusive <coughs> licensee. He refers in paragraph 18 to Nurim. Um, and then he rightly says in my submission, it seems to me that uh, the Nurim passage, which I referred to, to earlier, puts section 673 in context. It operates to, ins to ensure that the issue of remedies awarded against the defendant can be determined in circumstances where the rights of both exclusive licensee and proprietor can be taken into Further, as mentioned in my earlier judgment, it prevents a defendant who's been sued by an exclusive licensee being exposed to further action. I, will, I submit that's a perfectly proper approach to section 673. Um, he refers in paragraph 19 uh, that um, it's not said to, section 673 is not said to be subject to the view of the court. On its face, therefore, there is no discretion in its application. The proprietor has to make Having said that, I do not see that this means that steps taken in proceedings when the proprietor has not been joined must be treated as a nullity. I don't uh, understand the defense to be suggesting otherwise, and so on. My Lord, again, I submit that's a perfectly proper uh, observation. Paragraph 20. Given this, what I've concluded is the purpose, and my Lord, I emphasize the purpose of section 673. It seems to me that as a matter of principle, there's no reason why it should not be open to the court to join the true proprietor to existing proceedings using its powers under CPR 19.2. He then goes on to refer to Cresswell and Pablo Starr. Um, he then continues the last sentence, all the more so in a case such as this, as the present, where the judgment was solely on the issue of liability and the party to be joined may have an interest in the issue of quantum, which remains to be resolved. In paragraph 21, um, the defendants do not assert that the court has no power to order the joinder, or even that it has no power to order joinder at least this stage of proceedings. They argue rather that it would be unjust to make such an order because it would mean that Superwall would be pursuing its claim on a totally new, inconsistent basis. I do not accept that. My Lord, pause there for a moment. He's dealing with the submission put to him. This is a totally new, totally. And then he goes on to explain why that is not the case nor do I accept the submission that joined of the OR would necessitate a wholesale amendment of Superwall's case. Again, my respect on that part of the principle. Whilst Mr. Price and Superwall were both claimants, their claims were not dependent on each other. Again, I submit clearly right. Superwall's claim is based on his exclusive license granted by Mr. Price at a time when and Mr. Price was indeed the proprietor. For this reason, Superwall's claim was in no way dependent on Mr. Price's false claim to have given them their regained title to the patents from Mr. Bridge, and I do not see that Superwall's acceptance that the OR is now the proprietor means that Superwall's claim is a new claim or inconsistent with how its claim is argued at trial. It, and then, my lord, this is the passage my learned friend referred to. It seems to me that the requirement imposed by section 673 is more procedural than substantive. And I emphasize these last three words in this respect. If all the judges there simply say, well, bearing in mind um, that Superwall's claim is independent and that it 
there was a proceeding just the same way. It is really, this is a procedural rather than substantive matter. That's what the judge is talking about there. He's not commenting on specifically <coughs> section 673 can always be ignored, which is just a mere procedural point. He's simply saying in this particular case, its implications are more procedural. Then paragraph 22, what then did Mr. Maynard Connor's submissions regarding uh, the fraudulent nature of the claim being asserted by Mr. Price? He asserts that I should exercise my discretion under 19.2 by refusing to order the joinder of the OR because Superwolf was implicated in that fraudulent claim because Mr. Middleton, director of principal shareholder, had given evidence that supporting Mr. Price's claim to have made an assignment. So the judge turns his mind squarely, if I may, to the issue uh, which um, my learned friend was addressing the court on. He continues, it is true that Mr. Middleton gave evidence supporting Mr. Price's claim that there had been an assignment to Mr. Bridge, evidence which I found it was unlikely he thought was true. <coughs> However, as I've said, Mr. Price's claim was distinct from Superwall's as an exclusive licensee, and in my judgment, the court should not exercise its power under 19.2 simply in order to punish Superwall or to deprive Superwall of its settlement. Now, pausing there, my submission, all that is entirely in line with Summers. And I submit there cannot be any complaint, just on the joint point for a moment, there cannot be any complaint at all uh, about that passage. 24, I was referred by both parties to Summers. Well, we've read it. And so forth. Can I ask you, in 23, he says, evidence which I found it was unlikely he, that's Mr. Milton, thought yes. was true. That wasn't quite what you showed us earlier. It, it, this is, uh, you mean, in his judgment? Yes. yes. It, it's, well, the trouble is here, he's speaking after judgment. Uh, he is describing what he has found in his judgment. I would say slightly inaccurately. Mm. Because he talked about the fog of time in his judgment. Um, my lords, I, I do submit, if, you're, uh, if one's looking, so to speak, for what the, the real judgment is, <coughs> the actual judgment where he's considering the point precisely, rather than the rather more extemporary, uh, this is not an extensive judgment, but rather a uh, judgment where the precise wording, such as here, isn't so much of an issue. I, I don't want to be thought I'm dancing angels, dancing on pitbricks, but, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but even so, even so, my lords, that is, that this is how um, the judge is putting it. Um, but what he is relying on is the distinction between the two claims. And then in paragraph 24, he says, in my judgment, the present case is analogous to <coughs> Summers. Uh, eight minutes down. And I cannot see the circumstances that are more exceptional. So. Now, I I in my submission, there is no error of law here in the judge's judgment. You might say he's not taking out the heinousness of what has been said against uh, Mr. Against Superwall, to which my answer is he may certainly is taking it out, but he has taken the view but it is not a sufficient reason to deprive Superwall of its right of action. And that is entirely in, in line with the principles of Summers. And you say the same about costs? I do, because, my lord, if my, if, can I just go to the costs point? Um, just give me a moment to dig up my <coughs> notes. <coughs> the judge deals with the costs points at page 74 of, I think, the Flipcroft Appeal document, paragraph 21. I don't know if my learned friend took you to this. Um, now, there are two parts to paragraph. The first is whether it would be appropriate to make an order that Super will receive only a proportion of its costs of the patent claim, reflect those elements on which it failed. In my judgment, this is such a case, my lord. We have no issue with that at all. And then, um, about halfway down, secondly, moving on to a different one, it seems to me that I should take into account the conduct of Super Bowl by its director and shareholder, Mr. Middleton, in giving evidence in support of Mr. Price's claim to have assigned the patents to Mr. Bridge, evidence which I found it was unlikely Mr. Middleton believed to be true. Oh, okay. Using there the same sort of language as he did in the <laughs> Section 67 judgment. Um, uh, he, he seems to be going further than in the judgment itself. It seems to me to be simpler and more appropriate for the 
court to take that conduct into account by way of reduction in the proportion of superwalls recoverable costs, rather than for the court to order superwalls to pay some of the defendant's costs of Mr. Price's claim. And again, my lords, in my submission, that's a perfectly acceptable route to adopt. He is going to punish superwall, in a sense. He's going to say, I'm going to cut back your costs, which otherwise you'd be inclined to pay. One then goes to paragraph 23. Um, well, paragraph 22, I should say. Take it from, I've considered whether it would be proper to take into account the fact Superwall's case succeeded only by reason of the late joinder. Of the OR. Do you, do you no. appeal that reduction? Um, no, we don't appeal in, in our own appeal. Mm. We accept that when you look at Superwall's costs, whichever way you cut it, there should be a reduction of 25%. I mean, our main case would be, in normal circumstances, we'd be looking for 100% of Superwall's costs. But in our own appeal, we accept that we cannot have more than 75%. 75% of whatever percentage of costs yeah. you yeah. get. Yes. But you do, he also splits the cost 40%, 60%, and you do, you do appeal that. I, I appeal all that, but at the general principle, yes. I accept in broad terms that when, on my appeal, I say I sh Superwall should be getting 75%, not, should not be getting more than 75% of its costs. Yeah. That much I accept. So in fact, to the extent there's that deduction, I don't um, he goes on paragraph 22 to say, I accept that Superwall must pay the cost of joinder. Um, he refers in the last four lines, Mr. Maynard Collar argued I should go further, and that I should only grant permission for the joinder of the OR <coughs> in terms that Superwall be deprived of its costs of its claim up to the date of the joinder, and indeed that it should pay the defendant's costs of that claim up to the date. So the judge is clearly turning his mind to this issue. So one looks to the answer see whether he's there on <coughs> principle and so forth. But for Superwall's involvement with Mr. Price's false claim to be the true proprietor of the patents, I would have no hesitation in rejecting the argument. It's true that under section 67, there's <coughs> a requirement that the proprietor be a party to a claim brought by the exclusive licensee. But as noted in Begum, the fact that the claim would have failed but for an amendment is not of itself a reason for ordering the amendment, amending party to pay the costs up until the date of the amendment. It all depends, as Lord Justice Dean said, on the facts of the case. And in the present case, and this, my lord, is the point I particularly rely on, in the present case, the fact that the OR was joined late did not in any meaningful way add to the cost of the action, other than as regards the cost of the joinder application. Indeed, as I pointed out in my uh, Section 67 judgment, Section 67 is directed primarily to issues of quantum, yet to be resolved, rather than liability at the court of trial. For this reason, I also reject the argument that this is the case where the general rule in Bioko applies. In contrast to Bioko, this was not an amendment which, quote, substantially altered the case in which the defendant has to meet. My lord, that was the phrase used in Bioko. And my lords, again, I submit, well, that's obviously right. Indeed, so far as the defendants were concerned in meeting Superwall's claim, it made no difference exactly who was the <coughs> The judge then goes on to note that the defendants themselves didn't take the section. Every other aspect of Superwall's claim remained the same. Moreover, there's every reason to think that, even if the, and I, I particularly emphasize this, even if the OR had been joined at an earlier stage, Superwall's claim, quote, would have been vigorously resisted, to use uh, Lord Justice Stewart's uh, Smith's uh, words in Bioko, with the result that the general rule should not be applied. On this basis, it would, in my judgment, be unfair to deprive Superwall of its costs and even more unfair to order it to pay the other side's costs up to the time of the joinder that was needed to comply with section 67. And then he goes on in paragraph 24 to deal with Mr. Maynard Connor's point that the change in Superwall's claim was a change that was forced on it only when the falsity of its case came to light. And then he goes, to refer, goes on to refer to Lord Clark's judgment in Summers, um, uh, where Lord Clark said, as to costs in the ordinary way, one would expect the judge to penalise the dishonest and fraudulent claim to the cost. It's entirely appropriate in a case of this kind to order the claimant to pay the cost of any part of the process which have been caused, my lord, you have my point about the cause, by his fraud and dishonesty, and moreover to do so by making orders for costs on an indemnity basis. They may often be in substantial sums, and so on. Uh, my lord, again, the judge is looking at exactly the right considerations. He's taken into account uh, some of the Paragraph 25, 
these comments clearly suggest that it might be appropriate to penalise a party which has given false evidence. However, I do not think these comments are particularly relevant to the present case. Given what I've said about the purpose of Section 6 7, I don't think it's said that two false claims, as it were, two separate items, was founded on the false claim that Price was a proprietor. Proprietor is a necessary party, uh, uh, but largely so that issues of quantum can be properly considered. In that sense, the costs of two false claim, as regards the issue of liability, for me, were not costs that were caused by the false evidence. Again, the causation point. Moreover, as I've mentioned, two false claim is always likely to be resisted by the defendant. In any event, uh, I've already cited Mr. Middleton's conduct. <coughs> Giving the evidence he gave in support of Mr. Price's false claim to the proprietor justifies a deduction. So he's saying, I accept Super Wall must pay for this, but that's all part of the 25% reduction. I'm not going any further. I'm um, always going to ask rhetorically, what is wrong with all that? A different judge might come to a more stern conclusion. Right, so then you repeat the points in paragraph 25 which have already made in yeah. paragraph 22. You obviously feel strongly about them. <laughs> <laughs> but, by all, but e even so, allow for repetition and so forth. This is, this is, you may say, he's a generous man. You may say, Mr. Caddick is a, uh, he's, he's, a he's, not, he's not of the sterner uh, type of judge, but it's well within his discretion. And he hasn't overlooked something that needed to be looked at. Yeah. I mean, we have that point. Yeah. So, my lord, I think so. Uh, uh, that's it. I think that's what I say on costs. There's no error here. Yeah. This is simple as that. He's not gone outside the, per the perimeter, if I can use that phrase, uh, from Mr. Justice Simon's judgment. So, my lord, that's what I say on the, my learned friend's appeal. Can I just mention one point? And that is, my learned friend says, oh, well, we got this, um, we got the, in fact, it was Thomas Trick on the court, and the Committee for Contempt of Court and so forth on the back of the um, summary judgment. My Lord, one has to be careful with that. First of all, once the order was made, it was for him to obey it. And he was found in many respects to be guilty of contempt of court in relation to the orders made on the patent claim. But there was another aspect which was the judge, Mr. Recorder Campbell, had also given judgment on the copyright claims, summary judgment on copyright claims, and made all sorts of orders in relation to the copyright claims. Which failed. Uh, well, eventually, but, but there, there was no suggestion that the copyright claims were fraudulently brought or anything like that. Well, but, I'm yeah. not sure about that. And they also affected by evidence about assignments that hadn't been made and so on. So I don't think the judge, the judge doesn't make any finding that the copyright claims themselves, no, mm. and from recollection he rejects the copyright claims on the basis that title hadn't passed through the chain, the, the chain of title hadn't actually passed properly to the claimants. Right. Uh, but the only point I'm making here is that it's not the case that the only reason for a contempt of court being, a finding being made, is to do with the evidence on the patent claims. It was also, <coughs> also made because of disobedience to the court's orders on the summary judgment application in relation to copyright. But my bigger point, I can give you the references if you like, where you can see that um, uh, this was there were some quite serious contempts. Uh, but my bigger point is, it, is it doesn't go to the question of costs or joined it at all. If for whatever reason, the defendants deliberately breached the order that was made, even if that order should have been made. <coughs> and as for uh, my learned friend's point about summary judgment, well, and the costs of the appeal to the Court of Appeal. Well, all that's been dealt with. They got their costs of the appeal to the Court of Appeal in large part, and the costs orders in front of the Court of Campbell were overturned. So, my lords, that again, in my submission, is not a relevant point, and there's no reason why, so to speak, that should weigh in the balance against what the judge's order was. My lords, I don't know if it's a convenient moment. Um, I'm, I've finished, as it were, with my own friend's appeal. And I suspect the cost of appeal is going to be a bit shorter. Well, my lords. <laughs> Quite a bit shorter, actually. Yes. yes. Lord, well, Lord, I've got, a few, with your permission, I've got a few points in reply. No, I think we'll take your reply together with the. I think we may as well take the whole thing. We don't need multiple speeches. No, oh, oh, so I'll do it when I do the reply, yes. General. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two o'clock. Court rise.